Hello, thank you for having me. Uh, thanks, Jeff, and everybody else uh, who I have met through this lovely community, and I'm really happy to be here. So as Jeff said, I'm uh, Nicole Emmelheins. Um, I'm an assistant professor of um, rhetoric and composition at Christopher Newport University, which is in Newport News, Virginia. So I'm coming from the East Coast. And I also direct the Writing Center and the Writing Program. I'm a Writing Studies Specialist. I will always admit that I just moonlight <laughs> in Howard and Pulp Studies. Uh, but like I said, it's such a lovely community and I find that I can do a lot of really interesting work uh, with the Writing Studies um, background that I have. So today I'm going to be talking a little bit about how um, Howard, through his um, establishment of the sword sorcery genre, actually created this really interesting um, fictional place and space for gender dynamics to be explored. And I'm bringing in a couple different um, projects that I've been working on over the past couple years with Howard. Um, something that was published in Skelos also touched upon this with C.L. Moore's work too. So there's some overlap between some other projects. Um, but I'm going to start with how I got into Howard. And, um, you know, before I knew of Conan the Barbarian, as far as Howard created him, I came into the Conan universe through two very popular culture avenues, uh, which you can see behind me. Um, so the uh, 1982 uh, Conan the Barbarian movie, uh, and there's Valeria there from that. And then as I um, got a little bit older, I um, started watching the Conan the Adventurer cartoon on Saturday mornings, and that's Jasmine uh, from the cartoon. And now, obviously, with time and age and wisdom, um, I am much more aware of uh, things that Jodas Priedis has talked about as far as there's the popular culture Conan and then there's the literary Conan. And my entry into the Conan universe came through the popular culture side, which is maybe one that a lot of people more my age, um, how they came into it. But I found this to be incredibly um, important because not only could I watch these kinds of cartoons and movies with my brothers and my father, um, but I also got to see these two really badass um, different types of female characters uh, that were acting in these uh, different types of media worlds. Um, so this was important for me um, and this was for a couple different reasons. Sorry, I'm trying to talk, but also read off of my notes. It's not easy to do. Um, and their presence on the screen um, showed these two women who could take care of themselves, but they also really complemented well with what the different Conan um, that we saw in these different two types of media were doing. So often their skills and abilities would complement one another. And even though I know uh, Valeria was obviously a romantic interest of Conan in the movie, and it, I think it's just implied, right? Does anyone know, was Jasmine actually ever romantically involved with Conan or just kind of had a crush on him, right? I don't know. Uh, but I feel like that ended up um, kind of taking second place to the fact that they worked really well together and they respected one another and they had a similar type of skill set. So why is all this important and what am I going to talk about today? Um, I think a lot of people in the academy that I come from and even maybe more broadly in popular culture see sword and sorcery as a very sexist or misogynist genre. And I want to actually argue the opposite of that, that um, I feel like it is a type of feminist genre where a lot of different explorations of how gender is performed take place. And I think you, yeah, your presentation actually worked really well today uh, with introducing um, that character and, and things like that. So I'm going to talk about a couple different things um, that, again, are weaving in different projects that I've been working on. That first was that Howard was a type of gatekeeper. And I'll define that a little bit later on. Um, and he allowed others to come into this um, fictional genre space and, and work with it in different types of ways that I think have led to some really interesting uh, story and character creations. Um, and again, that sword and sorcery as a genre itself can be read as a feminist genre or one that demonstrates an awareness of the social construction of gender and the expectations that then certain gender performances might carry with them. And I would also say that some sword and sorcery ends up critiquing a lot of these very traditional and normative gender performances. Um, so let me go ahead and give you a little bit more definition. My definition of sword and sorcery that I'm using um, works written in the pulp fiction style that features central action and combat with supernatural entities in a pre-modern setting. I'm drawing a lot off of Jeff's work here. So <laughs> thanks, Jeff. 
Uh, and then a lot of um, feminism and feminist um, ideas and views, again, have been maybe, let's say, corrupted in a lot of popular culture, uh, media, and ideas. But I'm going to come from it from a very broad perspective, and again, one that's more performance-based. This is coming from the theorist Judith Butler, uh, who I did not, you know, for the sake of time, quote from her, because she's very verbose. Uh, but I'm generally taking this idea of feminism being that all people, no matter what their gender, should be treated equally, should have equal opportunities, and should get to define how they live their lives. Um, and when I'm looking at sword and sorcery then as a particular feminist genre, um, I'm arguing that it's meeting two conditions, that it's uh, meeting a political condition as well as a thematic condition. And the political conditions um, are that it's challenging gender performances by creating this world in which all the characters, again, have more of a choice. They have a lot more um, autonomy about how they're going to behave and what they're going to do and, and how they're going to live their lives. And then thematically, that uh, worlds in sword and sorcery don't simply take as a default that gender is a biological construct. And this is getting back into, again, more theoretical concepts with feminism, um, essentialism and non-essentialism. Uh, the belief that we are who we're born into and that kind of sets in motion how we can, how we can be is an essentialist biological view, but this is taking a much more social constructivist view, so that we are not simply locked into a set of uh, roles and behaviors that we take on when we're born, but we get more of a choice. Um, and this is, again, talking more about Judith Butler's idea of performance. So um, things that might include one's clothing, how you speak, how you talk, and how you position yourself in relation to others. All of those things, I think, uh, become very important. So um, with Howard himself then, as one of the, um, if not the major um, author figure identified with sword and sorcery, uh, he was doing a lot to help set different types of fictional expectations and rules in place. Um, and this is drawing from a lot of my background in writing studies work. So um, um, I take the notion of what's called a discourse community, and this is just simply a fancy way of saying People who are in the same group, and this could be a um, professional group, a career group, it could be a group of friends, it could be another type of group, um, they decide that there are certain rules for how they're going to write and speak to one another. And Lovecraft and Smith and Howard, along with a lot of the other weird um, writers of the time, were creating and defining these genres. So they were all working together to decide, well, this is how we're going to um, do these types of fictional worlds. And so the major figures who helped him inform the community of the rules and also help bring new members into the community were called gatekeepers. And traditionally, Lovecraft has been seen as one of the major gatekeepers. It's like called the Lovecraft Circle. Um, but one of the positions that I'm coming from is that uh, Howard, too, should be considered a gatekeeper, and especially in his creation and establishment of sword and sorcery as a genre, and as one that I'm going to argue has a lot of flexibility about how characters can behave. Um, and I also think it's important that we remember that Howard himself probably had a lot of influence on Lovecraft, which I think sometimes gets overlooked uh, quite a bit. And like you were talking a little bit about that very uh, famous conversation about civilization versus barbarism, I would imagine that that influenced Lovecraft quite a bit, as much as it might have influenced Howard himself. So this is all just very important to remember that he wasn't simply just one of the circle, one of the members of the discourse community. I really do feel like he was um, very important in setting these rules and um, informing others of them. Uh, but this is all to say that this is you know, a modern interpretation of what he was doing. I don't think he was intentionally putting himself out there to serve in this role as a gatekeeper, like Lovecraft was definitely taking other people's words and uh, revising them and, and offering suggestions and line edits. So it's just to remember that um, I don't think he was deliberately making these choices. I think he's now, with the, um, in retrospect and with time, we can look back and say he was doing this really important work, though he himself may not have recognized it as doing such. Um, and I haven't read all the letters. Unfortunately, you know, we have a lot of other people who <laughs> have, have, but um, in this letter, that um, Howard was writing to Harold Pierce. Um, he was kind of combating him. I didn't see the other letter or the, um, what Pierce himself had said, 
Um, but I thought this was a really just interesting bit of personal anecdotal evidence about how Howard might start to, um, how might have viewed women in particular. And there's a picture of Novelin right there too, because I think this second part um, plays in really well to the role that she herself might have played in his life. Um, so again, in the, he's talking to Harold and he's saying, you're right, women are great actors, but I can't agree with you in your statement that the great women can be counted on the fingers of one hand. Men have set at the feet of women down the ages and our civilization, bad or good, we owe them to the influence of women. So I think he's very upfront um, in positioning the importance of women. And then he goes on to talk a lot about how there were many important uh, women thinkers and philosophers and writers, um, certainly more than you could count on one hand. And then I, I loved this, um, it's toward the end of his part in this letter about his ideas of women. But women have always been the inspiration for men. There have been countless women whose names have never been blazoned across the stars, but who have inspired men onto glory. Um, and I know that in a lot of ways that Novelin, for instance, was very influential in some, some of his characters, perhaps, though we can't say for certain. Um, oops. So I know I'm running out of time, so I'm gonna try to be very quick. Uh, and in particular, I want to look at um, Dark Agnes from the Sword Woman stories, and um, it's very sad that we only have the two and then the excerpt of the third, because I think he was starting to do just something really fascinating with the character of Dark Agnes, um, and that he's demonstrating this flexibility that they have within, with characters have within the sword and sorcery genre that really start to push the boundaries of their gender and reimagine what performance itself of gender might look like. Um, and in particular with the Dark Agnes um, stories, I think he was challenging a lot of very traditional gender roles. Um, I could have pulled a lot of different quotes out of here, but I thought this one from the Blades of France story was, was pretty concise, uh, and I thought it captured it well. So this is Agnes saying, and this is after she's already left behind her village and kind of taken on the role of um, this male-like character. Um, Fool must I say half the man in France France to teach them respect. Look ye, I wear these garments, uh, but as the garb and tools of my trade, not to catch the attention of men, I drink, fight, and live like a man. And in the larger paper I've written specifically about uh, sword woman, um, I talk about how she, Agnes in times like this demonstrates that she's in charge of the experiences uh, in the world and the way in which she wants others to understand her. So she's made a deliberate choice to move out of her village and the very um, you know, terrifying constraints that she was being put under by her father and being forced into marriage. Um, Though she has physical features of a woman that cannot be concealed through the clothing or the chopping off of her red hair, the way in which she carries herself and interacts with others, both men and women, show that she's not merely a woman pretending to be a man, uh, but something else entirely. So in the, the other paper I've written, I'm talking about how um, I think she becomes almost like a third type of gender. She's not man, she's not a woman, she's something else. But again, Howard has created this character and created this genre in which he gets to explore these kinds of questions. Now, how aware was he of these questions? Would he have even thought one day that there would be people looking at this and going, oh, this is feminist? Probably not. <laughs> but I think it's really fascinating that it was happening at the time um, that it was uh, being written. And so I'm gonna go ahead and wrap up so we can have a few minutes for questions. Um, so as I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, I think a lot of people um, often will think sword and sorcery and go, oh, you know, that sexist, misogynist genre. Um, but I think through some of Howard's work um, and certainly others' work like Moore's, you can see that there is a lot of exploration and challenging of traditional gender roles, uh, things that people would start to uh, challenge more outright um, in the 60s and 70s with second and, and the now third wave feminism. Um, and this genre creation allowed for these authors to start exploring this. And though I don't talk about this now, I think we can trace Howard's influence into other fantasy writers, especially the second wave fa feminists who are starting to take fantasy rather than other genres like science fiction as an opportunity to explore some of these questions about their gender and their performance and ask um, some questions about, well, what if this was different? And Howard, I think, was truly the gatekeeper that set that up to allow for that type of fictional exploration to eventually uh, come into being. And I would just like him recognized uh, more for the role that he did play in that. So thank you. Thank you all so much. We have time for
for questions. How about questions? Who's got questions? Yes. Why is it the paper did we end up instead of getting Agnes de la Pair as a modern cult author hero, we have read so many Right. Yeah. Yeah. Do that. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Just to do this very quickly. All right. Red Sonia was created for the Marvel comic book, comic Conan the Barbarian. Sword Woman was not published during Robert e. Howard's lifetime. Um, some of the writers, like C. L. Moore, did see and love the draft, but it just didn't get published. So that's why you don't see more of Dark Agnes. She didn't get out there until way too late. And when they were creating the Conan the Barbarian comic book, they decided to come up with this female foil character, and that's how Red Sonia came to be. <laughs> Inspired by Robert E. Howard, but separate from what he wrote. And at that time, she was not the Chaniel Dickini character. Right. Very yeah. good. And it, it, it came after. And then by, by that time, Doc Agnes had left. But I think that's an important part of the equation, the fact that, that Sword Woman was not published. You know, he wasn't able to publish that in the <laughs> 1930s. You know, it, it was ahead of its time, probably. And, um, you know, and so you know, when uh, the Roy Thomas version of Red Sonia came out, you know, based on Red Sonia Rogatine, uh, that uh, was coming after second wave feminism. And that was a, you know, more or less uh, you know, you know, progressive minded male writer trying to be. <laughs> You know, the, the, the sort of clunky, awkward attempt at you know trying to create a strong female character, and you know, and, and it, it, the chain male bikini actually wasn't in Roy Thomas's story originally. You know, that was artists that added that later, Esteban Maroto, and then of course Frank Thorne took it and ran with it. You know, Thomas, Thomas first brought uh, read something into the kind of thing by adapting. Adapting. Uh, uh, Shadow right, uh, Shadow yeah, Vulture. Shadow of the Vulture. He turned it into a into a Conan, Conan story. story. And um, she stuck in there. Right. And then he decided, hey, this is a good character. Let's keep her around. Right. But uh, but I'd like to get your take on that a little bit. You know, what do you what do you think about that? Uh, well, about how? Why didn't you know? Were, were the people just not ready for Sword Woman? They were ready for uh, for C. L. Moore's. Right. Characters, who you know, came Jirelle before, who right? came. Yeah, you know, I'm not even clear on that. I think they were written roughly about the same time. Yeah, I think, think Jirelle. Was, was, I think Jirelle yeah. probably after Black it. God's Kiss. Right. Howard sent a copy of Sword Woman to C.L. Moore. Right, and so the question is, were, were they done independently? Do you know? Yeah, just, yeah, yeah, yeah. So about the same time. It was right about the same time. Know that each other was like, yeah. Right. So. Yeah, I don't know what the reception would have been. It would have yeah. been interesting had it gotten published and we could see, like if it would have been in Weird Tales, we could have seen the discussions in the Irie and things like that. Um, but I know like with Jarrell, I, I think Moore was exploring a lot of these same questions too. Again, was she cognizant of the questions that she was exploring? Yeah. Maybe, maybe yeah. not with her. Um, but the fact that that, that seemed to have been um, a pretty well-received character and they wrote mm -hmm. several more um, short stories around her. I, I could have seen Dark Agnes, I think, being, I mean, she seems so fully developed in a way, right, yeah. that she could have probably taken on, I don't know, like, how successful, but I think it would have been nice to have seen more with yeah. her. Moore's yeah. story was published in the year tale. Right. Yeah. Way more tolerant than that's true. The right. yeah. Pulse and, and Dark yeah. Agnes is no fantasy and Right. It and, was and what you, to a journey mm -hmm. magazine. And what, well, then what you get, you start to get some hints of him putting weird elements into the, that's, into the fragment. So, after, but, but, right, so but he, he realizes... At that time, Moore had already sold the story, that's so he right. put that up here as a copycat, which he wasn't. Yeah, and so by that point, maybe he's thinking, well, I'll add a weird element. Maybe if I get into Weird Tales, I might have a chance. <laughs> and that story, Mistress of Death, right. was adapted into a comic book story. Right. As with Red Sonia. Right. Right. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, it seems and like a lot of times Red Sonia and Dark Agnes kind of get crisscrossed, yeah. right, in the popular culture in, uh, instance, um, what am I trying to say, uh, versions sure. of these different stories. Yeah. Right. Uh, Scott? Yeah. Um, just, you know, 20 years before with Edgar Rice Burroughs with Deja Thoris, I mean, she was, I mean, she wasn't exactly the same kind of character, but she was a pretty independent, powerful. You know, character with agency yeah. too, as and a woman. 
And when you look at characters like Billy and right. Valeria, right. he Robert e. Howard absolutely had those Burroughs-esque female action characters in his stories, just not the Dark Agnes ones. But and even without, and even not necessarily the obvious action characters, I think as Karen's shown, <laughs> even with with Yasmina, yeah, that's and, Yas, and Yasmina as well. Yeah, know, that's you know. one of my things. Actually, I was talking to someone about my defense of Natala, who's right, always yeah. in the Slithering Shadow, is always talked about as like one of these whiny, cringy, and I'm like, actually. She's a lot tougher and more interesting and more fully realized of a character. People just say, oh, well, she's pretty and she's like the girl he drags along. I'm like, well, if you're actually, you know, in the story, she's not like that. So even the slave girl characters have much more, some of them more than others, but that's more of the stories rather than the characters themselves. So, right? Yes. Even back in the world, Jerry, you've got Minor Haggard, she. Yep. And the uh, others, you know, are fairly powerful female figures. <laughs> sure. Yeah. I, yeah. I, Ayesha in you know Haggard she is, is kind of a, is a prototype for a lot of those female characters. Law of Opar in the Tarzan stories and probably Akavasha probably as well. I think in uh, in, uh, yes, in Howard's work. Yes. Yeah. Mundi. Yeah. in Talbot Mundi. You know. Like, yeah. In a lot of ways, Haggard is, is a fountainhead for a lot of this this stuff and these things. There's a question way back in the back yeah, there. Yeah, there you go, Dave. Yep. What do you think is the significance of these sort of proto feminist themes showing up in weird tales for the readership of weird tales? Like, um, so this stuff is bubbling up for Howard, and maybe he wasn't conscious of it, but it's appealing to the readership. And that seems very interesting. It's probably just, oh, can I go ahead? Oh, well, what were you going to say? No, I was just going to say, like, again, a stereotype, right, that these were all male readerships, but they probably weren't as much as, as we imagine that they were. Right. Yeah. That's true. I was just going to point out exactly the same thing, that there was a fairly large contingent of female readers for Weird Tales. One of the most vocal fans in the area was Gertrude Hemken, who was a huge Robert E. Howard fan, huge C.L. Moore fan, and she liked the female characters. Um, but again, Weird Tales was much more permissive and non-traditional than a lot of the pulps. Yeah. And you see a lot of the gothic fainting heroines in anything vaguely resembling weird fiction in the other pulps. It's just <coughs> what they had at the time. Weird Tales, you know, both, both Weird Tales and a lot of the, the science fiction pulps, that, that fan community and writer community tended to be uh, much more progressive thinking than what you saw in the weird menace pulps, for example, which were absolutely the opposite. <laughs> you know, and, and and those are the pulps that really play up a lot of the negative stereotypes about how women are portrayed. I think you know that we typically think of with pulp fiction. Uh, I think there's somebody over here. Okay, are we uh, is that close out of time? All right. All right. Last question. We got time for one more. If not, I've got a, a question. Uh, you touched on the Tala, so that was one of my questions I already <laughs> had. Um, so, uh, Bobby, question for you. So, what are, you know, one of the things um, that I, I thought was interesting, we were, you were pointing out, once he starts doing the, the trip to Mexico, there is, um, you start to see him in his fiction, not just the appearance of his characters having sex and displaying sexuality and sexual themes, but also the idea of crossing that racial line Sexually, and so does that correspond? You know, some of those, some of the stories like uh, you get the um, this the theme starts to appear. The the, the sort of the uh, sexually attractive yet forbidden dusky woman kind of thing, like you get in uh, you know in uh, Moon, of Moon of Skulls with Nakari, and um, in Worms of the Earth where you get you know the, you know Atla who is. You know, not just another race, but maybe not even completely human, right? And that miscegenation anxiety is, is a theme in those stories. Does that timeline, does that add up with these trips to these voyage towns crossing the border where Howard himself is breaking the, the racial sexual taboos of his time, even though that's kind of accepted, <laughs> right? You know, it's that sort of thing. It's forbidden yet, you know, alluring at the same time, you know, that sort of thing. It does largely correspond, but largely you have to remember that he wasn't publishing a lot until about 1928. So, you know, when he went down there and when he came back, that's about when he started publishing a lot of stuff. It's not that 
he didn't have a few female characters or sexual characters, but you don't really see the dark woman, light woman divide mm -hmm. until after he gets back from that second trip to Mexico. So again, it's one of those things, did something happen there or was it just a catalyst for the sexual racial tensions in his mind, in his community, in his life at that time? Because it wasn't always Mexico that you could go down to. Uh, again, the thing with Noble and Price, she was talking about the flat, which was an area of Brownwood where the African Americans primarily lived. And why would you go down to the flat and leave a half white, half black child? And this is something he can't answer in one who walked alone. Uh, it's just one of those things that was assumed with the masculinity of the day that it was more acceptable for men to be sexually attracted to women of other races, even if they didn't expect women to have the same desires or restrictions. But yeah, there, I think there is a real correspondence between his trips down to Mexico and then coming back and he's starting to get published in the pulps and this stuff is coming out. Excellent. All right, well, we are out of time. Thank you. Have a big round of applause.